Welcome to the <coughs> January 10th meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Uh, I will now ask the town clerk to call the roll. Chair Sherman. Here. Councilor Guvenali. Here. Councilor Jordan. Here. Councilor Lennon. Here. Councilor Sullivan. Here. Councilor Swift Kayata. Here. And Councilor Walsh. Here. Uh, please join me while we say our Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Sorry. <laughs> Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, before I ask my fellow council members for any reports or correspondence, it is my pleasure uh, to recognize the uh, outgoing chair of the council, oh. uh, Ann Swift Kayata. Uh, given Ann's uh, tremendous service to the council and, uh, shall we say, length of service, we're running out of things to give her uh, to honor her uh, for her work. I think she probably already has a gavel uh, and may already have a chair. Uh, uh, and, uh, however, uh, we did want to recognize uh, the tremendous work that Ann does for our community, for the council. Uh, and frankly, for the state of Maine at large, uh, through all of your policy work. Uh, so, uh, on behalf of the council and on behalf of the citizens of Cape Elizabeth, I present to you, Anne, I don't want to break it, a clock, oh, which states the Anne Spipiata Town Council Chair 2010. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Uh, and with that, I would ask if there are any other town council reports and correspondence. Oh, Sarah. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I was going to give my monthly um, report as the finance chair. Um, and I apologize for reading it, but I want to get it right. Um, as finance chair for this year, I have begun um, to work with the town manager discussing the foundation for the municipal budget for the fiscal year 2012. The manager plans to submit to the town council, <coughs> town council a municipal budget that will increase the municipal portion of the tax rate by 1.5%. This translates to uh, $6 per 100,000 value of a home, or put another way, um, for a home in town that's valued at $300,000, the municipal budget would add $18 to their tax um, bill for this coming year. Um, this would be the first increase after small declines in each of the past two years. The total projected expenditures for 2012 is $8,888,334, which translates to $340,647 additional spending over the current year allowing approximately 2% increases in both full-time and part-time payroll um, and some much-needed improvements to building and the building repairs and equipment replacement. Notably, Fort Williams, the annual maintenance budget, will increase by $80,000 over the current year, bringing it to $100,000 allocated for the next fiscal year in upkeep and uh, maintenance and repairs. <clears throat> With any luck, the uh, private fundraising might match that or come close and we can begin to invest in some of the capital projects and expenditures that were discussed at some length last fall. Um, we're at the half point of the current fiscal year and we're in excellent financial shape. Revenues continue to decline, especially investment income, which is only at $25,000 instead of $81,000 budgeted. Nonetheless, projections out to June show revenues will be at 100.3% of budgeted revenues thanks to the manager's fiscal expertise and prudent planning. Interestingly, state revenue sharing has declined each year since 2008 to a drop of 10.6 percent, and excise tax income has declined each year since, two, since 2006 for a cumulative drop of 12 percent. Closing on a bright note, for the first time ever, more than half the taxes have been paid at the six-month mark in this fiscal year, and it stands at 50.3 percent as of January 1st. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, would that report be available on the town website? Sure. Okay. Any other town council reports? Jim. Uh, two meetings of uh, note. First of all, the very first ordinance committee meeting for this year is to be held next week on the 19th at 7.30 in the morning. It will be in the Jordan Conference Room, and the agenda is on the website for 
uh, citizens to review. The second is on Thursday evening, the 20th, and this would be at the Department of Public Works in the cafeteria um, at 7 o'clock is the Fort Williams Advisory uh, Council, which again, because it's a huge priority for us this year uh, in terms of Fort Williams, there's a um, very aggressive agenda this year with, the, with that particular group, and I want to bring it to the attention of citizens that we uh, welcome you at that meeting as well. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Any other reports? <laughs> Uh, at this point, uh, it is our first opportunity for citizens to discuss items that are not on tonight's agenda. If you are interested in speaking about an item that's not on the agenda, please raise your hand. I will ask you to come to the lectern and identify yourself and your address, and then you'll have uh, three minutes to discuss, discuss the item. Is there anybody wishing to discuss an item not on the agenda? Yes, sir. <coughs> Hi, I'm Dan Harriman, um, long-time local resident, um, charter member of the Cape Wet team. Uh, sixth generation commercial fisherman fishing out of the Cape here, and it's just come to my attention that um, through the budget process and, and the multiple consolidations in the town, it was being considered that um, I believe Roger Long, the harbor master, is going to be leaving. And there was talk about consolidating with an adjacent town, um, possibly the Harbor Master Services. And I just had concern about the duties leaving the town. And the last couple of years, we've had kind of um, gaps in the, in the Harbor Master Service. You know, there was, there was um, not a great deal of mapping. Roger did a wonderful job of mapping the town. I mean, it's tremendous the work he's done if you've seen the maps and, the, and the, everything's plotted. And, but he didn't have a boat. It was really hard for him to do his job without owning a boat or having access to a boat. So I can see how the people in dealing with budgets may look at <coughs> consolidating with another town and trying to save a few dollars or something, but as a long-time rescue member in the water end of it and commercial fisherman, I fish part of my year. I'm here a couple of months, three months in the summertime. I don't know if you know how much fish has landed in the town of Cape Elizabeth. I landed a couple of hundred thousand fishing out of Kettle Cove last year. Um, there is actually no there's been nothing done about the infrastructure um, for commercial fishing or recreational access down here for years and years. Every year the town puts a lot of money actually into fixing our one right away onto the beach. It's rebuilt every year by the town. Um, and there's a much nicer access that was traditionally where we kept boats growing up. I never brought a boat home. There was an area where we stored boats and a parking area there that um, I don't know whether through negotiation we could get the town to open up another right-of-way so we can get a decent access onto the beach for the recreational people as well as maybe looking at the, some infrastructure for the commercial fishermen that are working off the beach. And I really, either way, you, if you contracted it out with Portland, you have the city of Portland Harbor Master trying to cover all the way to the mouth of the Spurlink River in Scarborough. If you contract it with the Scarborough's full-time Harbor Master, he has to cover all the way to Maiden Cove in Portland Harbor. It just doesn't seem to me crash. Mm -hmm. Anyways, that was just my concern. Um, when I first found out about this, I was actually interested in the job, and I went and inquired about it. And um, I don't know if I'm the person for the job or not, but I can see at this point, I think we really have to look at the resource we have down here at Kettle Cove and some of our other water accesses and how to expand them and exploit them a little more. I mean... This town of Scarborough just built a $2.2 million dock for their commercial personnel. Um, the other side is the city of Poland. They've been feeding the fish pier forever. 
Um, you go to Camp Ellis, they got a $2 million pier there for the guys to work up. I mean, it's used jointly through recreational and commercial, but we haven't looked at the resource we have here. And Mr. Hammond, if you could just... I think it would be a shame to see it farmed out and go to a different town where we might miss some of the resources and the safety end of it, you know, having somebody from Scarborough, just having somebody local that knows about the vessels in the area and whatnot. All right. Thank you. Jody Jordan, 83 old Ocean of Road, Cape Elizabeth. I'm a fisherman and a farmer, but I'd like to, the town to work hard on trying to keep a local harbor master in the town. If Roger Long is getting done, that's the rumor I've heard. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Are there any other citizens who would like to comment on an issue not on the agenda? If not, I would turn to the town manager for his report. Yeah, thank you, Chair David. First of all, I want to comment on the comments of uh, Mr. Harriman and uh, Mr. Jordan. I hadn't heard that rumor yet. Uh, I'm not sure where, it, where it's coming from. Uh, you know, uh, perhaps, you know, the Chief of Police is looking at the, the, that as a potential option. He hasn't specifically said that to me. Uh, the Harbor Master reports to the Chief of Police. Uh, you know, if anything we look at today when we look at positions, we always look at regional options. It doesn't mean that, that we do them, but we, but we do look at them whenever there's an opportunity for change, whenever there's, there's a possibility of looking at something. You know, I, I therefore, you know, greatly appreciate that you've taken the time to come here, uh, because one, you're informing me of something I didn't know, uh, and two, uh, you know, I, the concern that you have is something that, that definitely ought to be considered. Uh, there is an issue of the harbor master not having a boat, and I know there was one sort of proposed in the budget a couple of years ago for to the harbor master to have, and it, at the time it just seemed didn't seem practical because the harbor master at the time was traveling a lot, and uh, you know was more into you know making sure the moorings were in their right places on a on an occasional basis. Uh, but it is you know something that obviously when we look at the issue. Uh, I, I understand the importance of the harbor master being able to get out onto the water uh, to, to do that job. On the larger infrastructure issues, you know, I, we haven't considered docks uh, up to this point. Uh, you know, the, that need hasn't really come to us in, in any form up to this point. Uh, that's uh, a summary of that issue, and beyond that, I'll, uh, I'll give you written reports. So, thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Mike. <laughs> Uh, we now turn to a review of the minutes of our December 13, 2010 meeting. Do I have a motion? Move to accept. Okay. Second. A motion has been uh, moved. A motion has been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Okay, the motion carries unanimously. Uh, we now turn to our first item on tonight's agenda. Uh, Robert Steer of Nine Rock Crest Drive appealed a decision of the Director of Public Works to issue a driveway entrance permit for 6 Stonegate Road. Uh, the Town Council heard the appeal on December 13, 2010, and we tabled uh, action on that item to this meeting. Uh, before I go any further, I want to point out that uh, Councilors Governale, Swift Kayata, and Walsh uh, we're recused from participation on this item, and since we're about to resume uh, consideration of this item, I would ask that they move down to the other side. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, just by way of further background, uh, at the uh, December 13th meeting, we received presentations from uh, the appellant, Mr. Steer, uh, from the Director of Public Works uh, and his counsel, Patricia Dunn. We also had the town attorney, Tom Leahy, present to answer questions. Uh, as we uh, discussed the issue and deliberated, uh, there were two issues uh, concerning the driveway permit that uh, the council was particularly interested in learning more about. Uh, and we asked the appellant uh, and the Director of Public Works, and also invited uh, the uh, owner of the property at issue here, Early Bird Group LLC, 
to submit papers on two specific issues, uh, and these were outlined in a letter that the town attorney sent to the parties uh, via email on December 15, 2010. Just by way of reminder, the two issues were whether section 17-2-4, which includes the language shall be in accordance with all local regulations, whether that section required the public works director to, rev to review and find that the driveway uh, permit complied with the general standards of approval for subdivisions in the town of Cape Elizabeth, namely Article 16 of our ordinance. In addition, we asked uh, the parties to brief the issue of whether there were any conditions imposed by the developer of the Stonegate subdivision or imposed by the planning board uh, in its written approval of those plans that would prohibit or restrict the Public Works Director from issuing the driveway permit. Uh, Mr. Steer submitted uh, papers to the council, uh, I believe it was December 23rd, it was in compliance with the deadline that we set, so we appreciate that. And then Attorney Dunn, on behalf of the Public Works Director, submitted uh, her brief uh, in early January. Uh, Friday afternoon, I was contacted by the town's attorney uh, regarding a reply brief that Mr. Steer had submitted. Um, I suppose if we had thought about it uh, at the meeting last month, uh, my view was we would have allowed it because it's customary for an appellant to get the last word, if you will, uh, without having seen the brief uh, and, and after consulting with Mr. Leahy, I thought it appropriate to allow it to be submitted to the council. Uh, now having reviewed it, uh, I don't believe it raised brand new issues and, and that's not to suggest that it wasn't necessary or redundant, but what I say that because I don't think it created the need for another round of briefing. Uh, uh, so. I appreciate the, your having submitted the reply, uh, and the council has an, an opportunity to review that as well. Um, so at this point, uh, before we go further, I want to sort of outline uh, how I think we might proceed with the council's indulgence, but also I would ask the town attorney, uh, before we get there, to bring us up to date on sort of a companion proceeding that uh, occurred before the Zoning Board of Appeals in late December, that might be useful background for the council. So, Mr. Leahy. Thank you, Chair. Uh, David and members of the council. <clears throat> uh, yes, I think that summary of the procedure to date is accurate, and uh, the public uh, comment, as well as the uh, participation by the uh, appellant and the uh, public works director, I think can be deemed closed unless you uh, feel the need to reopen it tonight. Um, as to the separate matter, the issuance of a building permit by the code enforcement officer uh, for this lot upon which this driveway entry permit was issued uh, was appealed to the Zoning Board of Appeals. On December 28th, the Zoning Board of Appeals heard that appeal. The grounds for the appeal alleged that either the deeds in issue created a three-lot subdivision required, requiring planning board approval or um, this building permit for Six Stone Gate with entrance on Stone Gate Road constituted an amendment to the Stone Gate subdivision. Uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, denied that appeal. Um, the code, enforcement's, code enforcement officer's uh, building permit stands as we are here tonight. There are grounds to appeal that decision to Superior Court under ADB. Um, but it seems the Zoning Board of Appeals felt it was premature uh, prior to something happening on the third lot um, to uh, entertain that appeal as to whether or not a subdivision had been created or one that needed to be amended before the planning board. Uh, beyond that, I'm here tonight to, ass to assist. Um, we're, not, uh, we're here as your counsel. I'm not here for the Public Works Director. I'm not for or against this matter. I'm here to assist you in any way I can. Um, should any members of the council wish to go into an executive session at any point, uh, you have the right to do so um, by making a uh, motion approved by uh, three out of the four participating council members um, expressly stating it's for review with the town attorney 
of the uh, rights and duties of the town council in this appeal. Uh, I'm perfectly uh, willing to do that, uh, to do that as well as perfectly willing to stand up and provide any advice requested of me here in the public session. Right, thank you, Paul. Uh, I, uh, again, with the sort of uh, council's indulgence, I thought the, the way we could proceed tonight would be to review the proposed findings and conclusions that were drafted by the town's attorney, go through those, and if, uh, and then essentially approve each finding as we go along, or, or not. And as we go along, if anybody feels that a qualification needs to be made, or it might be appropriate to add in a finding or, or take out one, uh, this is meant to be a roadmap, but we are not bound to follow this uh, verbatim. So we do have some flexibility here, and if somebody feels like an issue has been missed or needs to be uh, phrased a different way, we can, we can do that. Uh, does that make sense to the council? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we had begun this process uh, at the last meeting, and my recollection was we had gone through uh, many of the findings of fact that are in the draft that we have before us tonight. However, to avoid any confusion on the record, and I don't think it will take too long, I, I suggest that we start from the beginning and, and just go through this item by item. Is that okay? All right. Jessica. One question. Um, do we need to vote on whether or not we accept any further documents? Uh, the, are you referring to the reply yes. brief? Yes. Um, I would ask the town attorney to weigh in on that. I, I, uh, Mike, go ahead, Tom. I think that uh, ought to be considered because it was submitted. We approved the submission and then the chair as well. Um, it was later than the 10 days given. Um, we thought that it'd be best to, uh, in a matter of fairness, to, to, to give the appellant that uh, last word, if you will, uh, to the uh, brief that had been submitted by Patricia Dunn on behalf of uh, the public works director. So I think that's proper. I think we can deem that properly before you. Again, uh, it's your. This is a unique appeal. There's, there's, there's not much in your ordinance to say what you receive, don't receive, how to handle this. So I think it's some of its discretion. We wanted to go overboard to make sure that given the request that this be submitted and reviewed that we did that. We thought that was, we'd rather lean on that side than shut things down last Friday. And in my sense of things, Jessica, was that if it had been raising brand new issues that were really a major departure from what we had already mm -hmm. heard about before, I, I may, we might be having a different discussion, but would anybody like to discuss that issue further? Are we ready to move on? Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, the findings, conclusions, and decision of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council driveway permit appeal for Early Bird LLC permittee tax map U31 lot 9D. I will read the introductory paragraph, uh, obviously, first. On Monday, December 13, 2010, the Cape Elizabeth Town Council, here and after the council, heard the appeal of Robert Steer Jr. of 9 Rockcrest Drive, the appellant, regarding a driveway permit issued, number 2010-12, the permit, by Public Works Director Robert C. Malley, the director, for 6 Stonegate Road, which is tax map U31, lot 9D, here and after the property. Prior to undertaking review and consideration of this matter, Council Members Swift Kayata, Walsh, and Governor Alley requested to be recused, and the remaining members of the council so voted. The director was represented by attorney Patricia Dunn. At the conclusion of testimony and submissions by the appellant, the director and members of the public, the council closed the public hearing portion of this matter and requested the parties to submit written briefs on two issues. Those briefs and a reply brief by the appellant have been received and reviewed by the council. The council makes the following findings of fact, conclusions, and decision. Council members, are we all set on that first paragraph? <laughs> all right, findings of fact. One, the owner of 6 Stonegate Road, tax map U31, lot 9D, is Early Bird Group LLC, the owner. Graham Pillsbury acts as the owner's authorized member. 
Tom, would you suggest we vote on each one of these findings? I don't think the first, um, first 10. Uh, I think you might find that the council would agree that those are all uh, pretty much uncontroversial ones. And then thereafter were the ones that I think were more placed in issue by the parties. And when we get through 10, then I'll just ask for everyone's approval of all 10. And please, if there's a question as we go along, please raise your hand and we can deal with it. Uh, number two, on October 28, 2010, the director issued the permit for the property. Three, on November 27, 2010, appellant filed an appeal of the permit consisting of an email notification of appeal. The, the appellant's property is located within the Stonegate subdivision. Number four, notice of this appeal was provided to the property owner on December 1, 2010. Number five, the council was provided with the following additional documents prior to the December 13, 2010 hearing. A memorandum from Robert Malley dated December 3, 2010, regarding issuance of the subject driveway permit. An email from Thomas Erico, a traffic engineering director at T.Y. Lynn International, dated December 3, 2010, regarding site distance measurements and requirements for the subject driveway. An email from Todd Gammon, a civil engineer with AMEC Earth and Environmental, dated December 2, 2010, regarding the grading of the subject driveway. Two sketches showing the proposed driveway, a statement of Rachel Samieskin, president of the Stonegate Homeowners Association, dated December 2, 2010, regarding the substance of this appeal, a copy of the Stonegate Phase II subdivision plan, and south entrance detail, the deed of Stonegate Road from Stonegate Associates to the town of Cape Elizabeth, portions of the declaration of the Stonegate Homeowners Association, and a presentation from the appellant regarding the substance of this appeal. Six, the driveway that is the subject of the challenge permit enters Stonegate Road. Stonegate Road connects the Stonegate subdivision to Mitchell Road. Stonegate Road is a public way conveyed in fee to Cape Elizabeth by Stonegate Associates by warranty deed dated December 5, 1989, and recorded in the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds at Book 9015, page 16. Stonegate Associates recited in its deed of Stonegate Road that the conveyance was subject to Stonegate's declaration of covenants, conditions, and restrictions. Number seven, Article three of the Declaration of the Stonegate Homeowners Association states, the association, quote, shall be responsible for maintaining, repairing, and replacing stone walls and landscaping within the road rights of way where such maintenance is not the responsibility of the town of Cape Elizabeth. Eight, the conveyance of Stonegate Road by Stonegate Associates to the town was of an area approximately 135 feet in width from its entrance at Mitchell Road back through area at issue in this appeal. The paved Stonegate Road is approximately 30 feet wide with vegetation on both sides. Nine, the driveway at issue is laid over approximately 25 feet of the owner's property and approximately 70 feet in the Stonegate Road right-of-way before connecting with the paved portion of Stonegate Road. Ten, the owner submitted sketches to the director which showed the proposed location, width, and arrangement of the entrance of the proposed driveway onto Stonegate Road. The director met with the owner at the site, advised the owner to move the proposed driveway location, and further advised the owner as to removal of vegetation. With respect to those findings, one through 10, uh, is the council in agreement with them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so all four of us are fine with those findings. Okay, conclusions. Driveway permits are governed by the ordinances of Cape Elizabeth, section 17-2-1 through 17-2-5. Based on the record evidence presented to the council and the council's findings of fact thereon, the council voted as follows. A. The appellant made a timely appeal to the Council of Driveway Permit Number 2010-12. Now, if anybody has questions on any of these issues, we can pose them to the, council, uh, the town's attorney, or we can also deliberate here. But it seems to me that one we ought to be ready to vote on. Mm -hmm. Okay. All those in favor? Okay. So, voted four to zero. The appeal was timely. B. The director had adequate knowledge of the proposed and final approved location of the driveway in relation to Stonegate Road and its center line, such that its failure to review a sketch in the town code enforcement officer's file showing the setback of the proposed building in relation to the center line of the traveled way prior to issuance of the driveway permit was harmless. Are council members 
prepared to vote on that finding or that conclusion? Okay, all of those in favor? So four to zero. C, the determination by the director that the owner satisfied the specific requirements of 17-2-4 is supported by the director's testimony and the written submissions of T.Y. Lynn International and AMEC Earth and Environmental. Does anybody have any questions or before we vote on that? Okay. All of those in favor of that? <coughs> Sorry, can I pause on that? Yes, go ahead, okay. Sarah. <coughs> This, if I'm, I just want to clarify with Tom, this relates to the specific requirements that are enumerated in section 17-2-4, including site distance. That's correct. Site distance grading and the like, the specific requirements set forth in 17-2-4. This is not a reference to the all other regulations language. Okay. All, right. all of those in favor of that conclusion? Okay. Four to zero. D, the phrase contained in section 17-2-1 of the ordinance that the issuance of a driveway permit, quote, shall be in compliance with all local regulations, close quote, does not require the director to review a driveway permit application against the general standards required of the planning board in its review of a proposed subdivision. Does anybody have any questions with regard to that conclusion? I do. Go ahead, Sarah. So in other words, this is the issue. This is addressing the issue um, <clears throat> of, this, of the possible difference between standards for the town and standards for the subdivision, and it's not saying it does not require the director to compare those two. All local regulations. Right. I mean, I th this this gets to the issue of whether the public works director was required to take a, to review Article 16. Uh, that's the subdivision ordinance. Uh, in determining whether or not to issue the driveway permit. Tom, do you want to weigh in on that any further? That's, what it, that's what it states. Um, the question, obviously, is, is um, an argument has been made that um, the requirement of compliance with all local regulations uh, puts in play and requires the public works director to look at the standards for approval of subdivisions by the planning board, um, in this case some 20, 20 years later. And the, we've, this is drafted for you to determine either he has to or he does not. If, we defer, do, if you do determine that the public works director does not have to review the planning board standards for approval, because it's an approved subdivision, um, that ends it. If you find that he does have to review, then the next question is, does 16.3.2 of the subdivision ordinance reviewed by the, uh, by the public works director require that he deny the permit? Can he issue the permit notwithstanding that? So the first is, is that applicable? Does he have to review it? And secondly, if he reviewed it, can he issue the permit notwithstanding that? Because it is in terms, I mean, I can quote it, but it's in terms of the plantings, et cetera, shall be maintained along the perimeter in a proposed subdivision. Um, there was no, in this case, it hasn't been brought to our attention by any party that there's any restriction imposed by the planning board or by the developer as to a buffer or as to maintenance of the vegetation or as to plantings in this area. So the standard there for the planning board to review, as a result of that review, we do not see that there was any limitation, restriction on the plans, on the approval of the, uh, of the planning board of the Stonegate subdivision. So the first one is, does it apply? Does he have to look to the standards of the planning, of, that the planning board would use and if it does, would it prohibit him from issuing the driveway permit, which you don't get to if you don't have to look there. Jessica. I, I'd like to ask a question in another way. Um, is there anything in Chapter 17 
relative to issuing a drive driveway permit that requires the public works director to apply anything in Chapter 16? Nothing directly. It would have nothing directly. It could only be if, under the argument of the appellant, that our regulations mean that the planning board standards to approve subdivisions applies to him. Okay. Are there any further questions? Folks ready to vote on this conclusion then? Uh, so this is, uh, so those in favor, in favor of this finding? Okay. okay, and those opposed? So it's two to two? Okay, and uh, E, well, the deed to the town of Stonegate Road for that section at issue in this appeal states the conveyance is subject to the Stonegate recorded declaration. That declaration does not limit the right of the town to issue driveway permits over town property to the Stonegate Road, a town-owned and maintained public road. The declaration expressly excludes from its restrictions, covenants, and conditions to those portions of the development shown as roads on the plan. Any questions for the town attorney? Before Jessica, I, I have a couple questions, Mr. Lay. Um, the, the declaration, I got very confused with the declaration and how it applies to roadways. Um, and it seems to me that the declaration, by its own term, does not apply. And so, could you elaborate on that? The declaration specifically states that the covenants, restrictions, and conditions in the declaration do not apply to the roads. Um, the argument is that because the declaration, as between the developer and the homeowners, provides that the association shall may maintain stone walls and roads to the extent not maintained by the town and charge that to the homeowners, that that agreement, if you will, that portion of the declaration as between the developer, subdivider, and the owners um, uh, restricted what the town could do with the deeded stone gate road that it acquired. Um, there is nothing in the declaration that says anything about driveway permits. Right. The, the, there was a provision of the declaration that spoke about people's lots and said no clear cutting shall be allowed, you can do something for views, but as, as to roads it says that the conditions, covenants and restrictions of the declaration do not apply to roads and uh, the only, it seems to me that the argument that's trying to be made by the appellant is that because the stone gate reserved by, through the association by saying subject to declaration, reserved some right to charge the homeowners for maintenance it did, that that limited what the town could do. Um, I think the other argument is that the town owns that tract of land and whether it's for safety or other reasons, it can put culverts in, it can do various things. It was not restricted by the assumption of the allocation of the costs of whatever the association did, did not limit what the town could do with this game. Does the, I mean, there's also a lot of um, uh, comment in the, um, in Mr. Steer's argument about vegetation and what this, the association has been doing for many years. Does the issuance of the driveway permit restrict the Stonegate Association's right or obligation to maintain that, uh, their vegetation and their stone walls? It, it, I mean, it, I guess the question is, is their vegetation? We are talking about vegetation within, on town's property. Correct. On the town road. Correct. It seems to me that it does not, that it, it, it might interrupt it a little bit, but it, it doesn't seem to change their right to enter 
and maintain the, the vegetation. I agree with that. Okay. I, I agree that to the extent it's not ma maintained by the town, right. they can do that. Although the town can always say we need better site distances, we need the trees that are coming in. Um, right. For drainage, we need to do some culverting. I think it's a town, pro that section, that tract of land is a town own tract of land marked as a road yeah. and, and conveyed by the developer. Okay. It, it would seem to me that if the developer had wanted this area to be treated differently, it could have so provided in the declaration. It would have provided more likely in the planning board approval. Either the planning board or the subdivider, developer, would have had forever while the could have put in a buffer. A, a buffer to be retained as a buffer. It's been called a buffer, but the buffer that we saw in the presentation of the appeal is not what's on the planning board approved plans. So it may it may be a buffer, but it's not a mandated buffer by the planning board. It may be in fact I think buffer connotes something uh, imposed upon the property. What I'm saying is it hasn't been brought to my attention in the pleadings or in the appeal that there was a restriction on that area by Stonegate developer or by the planning board remove and reviewing and approving the Stonegate plan. There, that, that does occur in other cases where the developer could have kept strips of land on both sides and conveyed only the fee to 50 foot strip and only the remaining pieces on both sides. That could have been done by the developer or it could be put on the plan that a note on the plan that is to be kept forever wild. That was not done. Jessica. Jen, I've just got one more question. In the warranty deed of 1989, is there anything in the deed as a matter of law or legally that would prohibit the public works director from issuing a driveway permit? In my opinion, no. Are there any other questions? Are members of the council prepared? Sarah. <clears throat> Sorry, I just want to be very clear. If I agree with the appellant that the agreement did limit what the town could do, I would not vote in favor of F. That's correct. You, you, would vote, you would vote no. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, all those in favor of, of inclusion E? Opposed? It's two to two. Uh, it is my understanding, uh, Tom, that given that there were those two issues are split two to two, the appeal does not carry the day. Is that am I correct that, in that statement? That's correct. It would be, to grant the appeal, you would need three out of the four tonight to um, to grant the appeal. So then, based on these findings of fact and conclusions, the town council voted on January 13, 2011 to deny the appeal of driveway permit number 2010-12. The decision will also read that any aggrieved party has the right to appeal this decision to the Maine Superior Court pursuant to the Maine Rule of Civil Procedure 80B within 30 days after notice of the Town Council's decision. I want to thank uh, the appellant and the Public Works Director and their attorneys and others who have given us information on this. Uh, I I think I speak for the council when I say this is a position that we're not accustomed to, uh, and I appreciate everyone's patience. Uh, Ma'am, that's really uncalled for, and I would ask you to refrain from a gesture like that in the future. Uh, in any event, uh, I have one final question for the town attorney, and uh, that is uh, we have been acting in a quasi-judicial role. Uh, we have made a decision. It is possible it could be appealed. Um, are, is the council under the same constraints that we've been in under all the way through this deliberation? In other words, I mean, I'm not sure I'm feeling like I'm free to just talk about this issue with folks now that it's been decided, but I just I need your guidance. Because hmm. you don't normally <laughs> see judges, you don't see judges going out there saying, well, this is why I did well, X, Y, and Z. I think that would be appropriate. Uh, to, to This matter may go into litigation, and I, I, I don't think it would be appropriate for the town members of the zoning board or in their case or in your case for different people to state their positions after it's been done. I mean, there's been a vote. The positions are on record. Um, I don't see anything to be gained. You can't, you're not supposed to have any sort of 
meetings among yourselves on these issues. Uh, I'm not sure that there's any, I think that would be the advice I'd give you, although I can't cite you chapter and verse that says you shall not discuss an appeal. We haven't had many appeals to the town council before. Okay. And lastly, we need to uh, actually have this signed, uh, so we will take care of that with through the town manager's office, uh, and then that will, the decision will be sent to the parties. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, item number 33-2011, uh, flagpoles. Uh, on May 8, 2008, the Town Council referred to the Planning Board a request to consider further regulation of flagpoles. The Planning Board is recommending no change to the current regulations. Uh, we all have had an opportunity to review a memo from the Planning Board uh, to the Council dated January 3, 2011. My understanding is flagpoles are treated as structures, and they're. Go ahead, Mike. Oh, finish here. Oh, uh, and uh, the, t the planning board is recommending that we not uh, alter the treatment of flagpoles. Mike, did you have anything further? Just to add? very briefly, I want to indicate a couple of things. One, Jim Hubner, member of the planning board, is here. Should you have any questions on how they arrived at this? Although I think it's fairly self-explanatory, but really appreciate his willingness to be here and answer any questions you may have. Secondly, I, you, you really have uh, two options before you. Uh, one is to just simply accept the report and the issue would be dead. Uh, the second option is to refer it to the Ordinance Committee. But, you know, unless you, you know, envision doing something, you don't necessarily have to refer it to the Ordinance Committee. There's no requirement to do it. So we could simply move that we receive the report and then take no further action? That's, that's one option. And the other option is to refer it to the Ordinance Committee. Do we have a motion? Jim? I move that we receive the report Second. as written. Second that. Motion's been made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? I, I have a question. Yeah. Yes. I, I may have missed this, but if we receive it, it's just a dead issue. That's right. Okay. Right. Thank you. That means you're, if you receive it, that means you're, in essence, in this case, you're accepting the uh, recommendation of the planning board to take no action. Any further questions? All those in favor of the motion? Thank you. The motion carries unanimously. Uh, item 34-2011, Fort Williams Park Group Use Policy. Uh, the Fort Williams Advisory Commission is recommending amendments to the group use policy for Fort Williams Park and an updated fee schedule. And we have uh, Bob Malley, the Public Works Director, here to answer questions. Bob, did you want to give a, a summary for the Council? I apologize. I am representing the Fort Williams Advisory Commission tonight. So, uh, and I was involved in the creation of the document, so I hopefully can answer your questions. Uh, probably to summarize, uh, there was a cover memo, but uh, uh, initially what we did was looked at the current uh, group use policy uh, as part of the uh, work of the Commission. And uh, to highlight the major changes for you, uh, first of all, one of the things we addressed was reducing the window, I'll call it the window for consideration of use requests. Uh, the this existing policy uh, had a requirement that the uh, uh, request had to be submitted at least four months prior to uh, the proposed use, we, uh, proposing that that be reduced down to 60 days. We have, uh, the Commission uh, is now proposing that the area fee, which has been an existing fee, uh, little used albeit, that that now be applied to group uses. Uh, the group use uh, is divided into a people intensive versus a vehicle intensive fee structure. 
Uh, some of you may recall that the Portland Symphony Orchestra used to come to the park each year. That was considered a people-intensive use, and they were charged uh, $1 per ticket. That's now being proposed to go from $1 to $3, and in addition, the area fee would also be applied if that's applicable to the use. Um, there was some wordsmithing that was done to, to clean up the document a little bit. Uh, and things that are underscored are our new language. Things that are strike through are, are proposed to be deleted. Uh, in the back of the policy, there was a number of regulations and uh, regarding the, the use of the picnic shelter. It's proposed that those be included in a separate document uh, put together by community services based on this template that would be used and sent to people who make reservations for the shelter. We are also proposing that the fee structure be separated from the document, which would be consistent with our ordinances, and included in the master fee schedule for the park. So, Thanks, that. Bob. Does anybody have any questions for Bob? Just one. Did you just say that the, um, the fees, you'd have to pay the group or the, I mean, for the group fee, you have to pay a people-intensive or a vehicle-intensive fee on top of the area rental? That's, that was their recommendation, okay. yes. Any other questions? Bob, I had a question on the amendment provision that's on page four. Mm -hmm. it, it, it crossed out after consultation with the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. So it says now, or the proposed language is, the Cape Elizabeth Town Council may amend this policy at any time upon a recommendation from the Fort Williams Advisory Commission, which sort of makes it sound like that's the, I mean, that's a may, but it, it sounds like the only way this gets amended is if we get a recommendation from the Advisory Commission. So when I read this, I sort of felt like we were yielding authority to amend to the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. So I don't know if that was the intent, but I, I guess I liked it the old way, that if we felt an amendment was appropriate, we would certainly want to ask the Advisory Commission mm -hmm. for its thoughts, but we wouldn't be sort of bound to, to wait for them to make a... No, I agree. I, I don't think that was the intent. I think you're right on that. Um, so I'm wondering, I, I would be in favor of just leaving the language the way it was. So would I. Okay. Frank? I have a question. <laughs> if a situation arises where the uh, council believes that fee should be waived, for whatever reason it is, is there any specific procedure we need to follow in order to get that done, or can it be done? Like to speak to that? The town council in any policy uh, has the right to waive a provision. This is not an ordinance. This is a, a policy. An ordinance, we, we don't have the right to waive unless an ordinance specifically says so. But a policy, the council can always uh, make any decisions that they choose. However, this entire policy is shortening the administrative process. So I don't know how the council's decision to waive something enters into that shortened decision-making process. You could we do it? Well, I, I don't know whether it can be done practically because the meeting agendas may not be in sync with one another because that was one of the issues we were trying to address by shortening up the four months <clears> to <throat> 60 days. I don't know whether, Michael, I don't know if you have any thoughts yeah, about I, that. Sure, the, yeah, sure the chair. Yeah, I, you know, the, the, the provision of why you usually ask a waiver, it's usually someone who's aggrieved by a party would ask for a waiver, would ask for a waiver. Uh, you know, provided there aren't significant time constraints, that would come to the town council with the request for a waiver because we're only administering this policy in conformance with what you direct us to do with whatever you pass this evening. Okay. So, but the, the waiver will, will, you know, will, it, it was very unusual, the issue you just dealt with. Usually you have an applicant that wants something Sure. Uh, it was that that is looking for a waiver. Yeah. Okay. You didn't deal with it. You were in the audience, but you get the point. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I, I understand. I, I just I just want to make it clear that we were shortening this up for administrative process, so, so. which doesn't necessarily lend itself to having a lot of input from other places in the organization, like the council, because of the scheduling process. That's all. Uh, okay. But whatever. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments? Uh, do I have a motion then? Yeah. I move that we recommend the amendments to the group use policy for Fort Williams Park in an updated fee schedule, but with the notation that on page four, 
In the last paragraph, it would read, the Cape Elizabeth Town Council may amend this policy at any time after cons consultation with the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. Second. Okay, thank you. The motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Item 35-2011, citizen participation at library trustees meetings. Uh, the trustees have recommended for the council to approve provisions for citizen participation at their meetings. Uh, we had in our package the paragraph outlining uh, citizen participation. Uh, do I have a motion? Jessica. I make a motion that we accept the, the Thomas Moore Library Board of Trustees citizen participation um, at trustee meetings and workshops paragraph or policy, I mean. <laughs> Second. Okay. Motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? Uh, Jim. I just want to commend uh, the library trustees for um, adopting our communication policies uh, at that level. Again, another, another statement of how we wish to have citizen input into the, uh, the goings on here in our municipality. Okay, thank you. Uh, all those in favor of the motion? Motion carries unanimously. By the way, we don't have many members of the public left here, but if you did want to speak on any of these issues, just feel free to raise your hand. Uh, item 36-2011, citizen participation at Arts Commission meetings. Again, uh, we have a one paragraph proposal for citizen participation that was included in our packet. Do I have a motion? Anne. I move that we accept or approve the provisions for citizen participation at the Arts Commission meetings. Second that. Thank you, Caitlin. Uh, any discussion? Jim. And I just echo the same comment for the Arts Commission, thanking them for adopting this policy to allow citizens' participation. Thanks, Jim. All those in favor of the motion? It carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, item 37-2011, Town Council Goals for 2011. Uh, we uh, finalized or discussed the goals at our workshop uh, recently, and in response to the feedback, the town manager did revise these. Uh, we've all hopefully had an opportunity to review them. Before we get to a motion, does anybody have any questions or comments? If not, is there a motion? Sarah. Move we adopt the proposed town council goals for 2011. Second. Second. Thank you. The motion has been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion. All right. Motion carries unanimously. And I will look forward to seeing the uh, implementation of these goals. It's an ambitious uh, uh, document. And I am sure we are up to the challenge. Uh, Item 38, 2011 Capital Improvement Plan. Uh, Mike, do you want to briefly discuss this for the this, council? This I really troubled over this, this year because the, the amount, there were a lot of requests that come in, came in, a lot of them were maintenance, the replacement of old pieces of equipment, and we were looking at the longer term. And so as a result, I struggled over it. And then I didn't leave myself enough time to add all the pretty pictures and some of the analysis <laughs> and some of the other stuff that I wanted to do. So if you note, there's a comment in there, and I underlined it, that it's still a, a work in progress. Uh, the, the, the important piece here is that you know, we do have quite an infrastructure of land that we own, of, of buildings that we own, of equipment. And you know, this plan looks to make sure that we, we take care of those assets that are entrusted to us. We replace them at a reasonable level. We spent a lot of time last year really looking at uh, at equipment and when it ought to be replaced. And I know there was some suggestions during the council goal session of, of looking at additional metrics. And you know, instead of just looking at years, look at miles, look at engine time, look at some of those issues. And that work we still need to do. But uh, you know, while that is ongoing, and you're not being asked to actually adopt uh, you know, the plan for this year, at this point, it's just being recommended that you acknowledge receipt of this, and with the understanding we're going to continue to be working on it, uh, particularly between now and when the budget is submitted to you in uh, Thank you, Mike. Does anybody have any questions for the town manager or comments at this time? 
Frank. Uh, two. First, as it relates to the library, is the assumption there that it's just basically status quo as if no major renovation is going to occur? That, that's something I'm, I have trouble, again, the initial I'm having trouble with. There, there is proposed in here 125000 in that would come in next year's budget to pay for some boiler work. The, the building is really having a tough time. If you notice on the, the I didn't number the pages, on the uh, projection for FY 2014, uh, there's also a recommended bond uh, for that particular year of $4 million for the library. Uh, and that, to be honest, more than anything, that's a placeholder. It's to keep it before you. And it's, you know, I, we're going to struggle in the next few months to figure out to what level we ought to be investing in boilers and other things at the library, not knowing what the, what the long range plan is. But, you know, I don't know, I, I, we don't have answers yet because we, we don't know. But the library definitely is going to need some bit of investment even to keep it going the next two or three years. And we're going to be looking at that list. But there is a placeholder in there for a bond. And, in 2014. The other question really, it's, it's sort of tangential, but it relates to the schools. I mean, uh, the schools haven't in the past developed um, the kind of capital planning approach that we have, or you have, Mike. And yet, <clears throat> the budgeting of uh, bonding is coordinated through you. Yep. So um, I'm wondering to what degree perhaps conversations have started with the interim <coughs> superintendent. Uh, in particular, my mind is the need for the boiler at the schools which is the perfect asset that should be bonded as opposed to expense since it's a 25 or 30 year asset. And so where do we go from here? What's being done? What are your thoughts? There's a couple of different comments and questions. Yeah. The Pauline Portrait, the school business manager, actually I had asked her for a submission on this and she had one ready to give to me late in December. I indicated to, in, to her that let's hold off a little. I think the new superintendent ought to say it and you know, and I don't know to what degree she's spoken with him, but but they have they have prepared something for, for him to look at and for his consideration. Uh, the boiler, uh, that's an issue that uh, you know is still the top alternative energy committee looked at last week, uh, looking at the plans for it. Uh, you know, that's something that needs to come to uh, a conclusion in the next two two and a half months if they're to do the work this summer when they, when they expect to do it. Uh, you know, they, they do have some contingency that's set aside. I don't know to what degree they plan to do that. Uh, you know, Alan Hawkins uh, did meet with me once to discuss the potential of bonding. It was an inconclusive discussion. And, you know, I will, uh, I will speak with the new superintendent, Ken Murphy, uh, just not <coughs> pushing them in any direction. Mm -hmm. but to find out, you know, what their plans are for financing it. My guess is, you know, today he was just starting to review school budgets. Uh, so my guess is he probably hasn't given it too much thought yet. What would be the argument for not having it? Because it does seem kind of asset you would uh, Because there's always other things coming up all the time thereafter that also need work. And do, they, do they want to loosen up resources in succeeding years by having gotten this out of the way? Because there's always going to be, you know, they're like they're a lot like we are. They only a, a lot more so. They have buildings that are valued at forty million dollars, and if you look at how much ought to be invested in forty million dollars, this boiler is is and what they're spending on that is really the amount they ought to be spending every year if they keep up on stuff. I think they, they really need, and I I haven't seen what Pauline's come up with, but I think they really need to come to grips with long range what they ought to be doing in the buildings and. If you, if you just simply borrow it all the time, you end up paying a lot more instead of just making a steady investment of whatever the, 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 uh, the uh, determined amount is that needs to be done to keep up with the infrastructure. Okay. Jim? Well, I'm Jessica Head. Oh, <laughs> Jessica, I'm sorry. I was, yeah, I was at a school board finance meeting last winter in which the boilers were discussed, and I'm pretty sure the fee or the amount of money that they were holding and contingency was around 500,000. What I don't recall is what their, and, and that issue came up at our joint school board town council meeting that was held later. And, um, and I recall that that was downplayed to a certain degree later on at that joint meeting. But I do remember that it was a, quite a large figure that they had in contingency funds then. So I, I don't know what may have happened to that, that amount of money, but. Just 
Go ahead, Mike. I, I should add one point. There, there needs to be a financing plan to go forward with the boiler, but the, the actual borrowing of money, if that is the case, uh, isn't an immediate concern. That could wait until after the project on the fall, because we do have the, regardless, we have the cash flow to support uh, getting the work done. Okay. Uh, Jim. Uh, just a question. Last year we had one of our objectives was to look at space and facilities and looking at the prop utilization of that space on a today and going forward futuristic sort of view. And I just wonder how that unfinished piece of business impacts some of the capital decisions that we may or may not make or what has been proposed here. Um, if you look at a police station that's a good portion of it is not utilized at the moment and you look at what may or may not be suggested for investment there, I mean, those are all things that I think we need to get our arms around on a go-forward basis, coupled with the school department um, before any kind of a, an action plan is taken as a result of this capital presentation today. I, I just feel that that's one of those things we really need to get our arms around, um, space utilization. Um, you know, the municipality is, uh, is whether it's growing or not growing or whether the, the way we go to market in terms of the types of services we provide and the amount of space we have, I think we've got to figure this all out before we accept a, you know, a commitment to spending X dollars over the next several years because it may very well be that we're going to declare something redundant and possibly sell it. But it's my understanding right now, for purposes of tonight, we're not approving this. We're just acknowledging receipt. This is going to be an ongoing dialogue, right? Yeah, I, I do need to respond to something Council Waltz just said about possibly selling the police station. I'm, I have a meeting Friday with the police union. Yeah, I didn't say and, sell the police station. I'm well, saying space. If we, we, we own different buildings here in town. Yeah. That we own buildings next to the, next to the, the library. Yeah. I mean, are those things that we will continue to keep if they're yeah. declared redundant? That's all. No, that's fine. I, I just want to, there's, there's lots of suspicion that somehow we want to eliminate the police department. And, you know, the, <clears throat> the union has asked to meet with me in a meeting with them on Friday. And, you know, I, it's not in the immediate plans to do that. It's not in the plans to do it. Uh, as I'll be telling them, you know, inevitably there may be some consolidation, but all of the current options don't seem to take us anywhere at <clears throat> this point. Uh, so I, I just, I just get nervous. The, 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 there may be some interpretation uh, to that. I, I just want to publicly say that, uh, you know, that that's not a direction that, that I'm looking at. But uh, at the same time, there is some available space in the police station, and I'm continuing to have discussions, particularly with the school department, uh, at uh, perhaps how that space might be able to be utilized in uh, in relation to some of their needs as well. Frank. Just in terms of timing, when, when do we sort of put this to bed, just to sort of respond to Jim's inquiry? You, you put the monies that are being spent, proposed to be spent for fiscal year 12, to bed as you review and adopt a budget. Uh, you don't put any of the future years to bed until the decisions are before you at, at any given year. So we have a couple of months? You have at least a couple of months on what the proposal is for fiscal year 12. And, and as I say here, yeah, the proposals may still change a little bit between now and when you actually get the budget, uh, as new, new issues come forward. We do that. Okay, uh, unless there are more questions, do I have a motion? Jessica. I have a motion that we ex accept uh, the uh, town manager's capital improvement plan, that we receive it. Oh, we actually, acknowledge receipt of it? We, yeah, we, that's right. We acknowledge receipt of it. <laughs> <laughs> Not trying to put words in your mouth. Okay. No, but that, that is what I intended to say. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do we have a second? Second. Okay. The motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion? All right. Carries unanimously. Thank you. Um, item 39-2011, the personnel code, personnel code amendments. Uh, these are set forth in the town manager's memo to us dated December 14, 2010. Uh, it, it, Mike, it, you, you actually did a very effective summary on the first two pages of that handout. Would members of the council like a summary or we, or maybe just move right to questions or do I have a motion? Sarah. 
I move we approve the proposed changes to the personnel code as set forth in our packet. I second that. Okay, the motion has been made and seconded. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor of the motion? Okay, motion carries unanimously. Item 40-2011 uh, is a new lease agreement with Edward D. Jones and Company uh, for space at 343 Ocean House Road. Again, the town manager has given us a summary of the new lease as well as a copy of the lease. Do we have a motion? Frank. Move to accept the proposed lease for a Edward, uh, Edward Jones. Motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Okay, motion's been made and seconded. Any questions? Jessica. Yes. Would, would uh, Mike review this, please? Should I? Would you review this? Oh, yes. Be happy to. Uh, if I don't knock my coffee over. Uh, yeah, right now, we have a lease with Edward Jones for a portion of the, the <coughs> old farmhouse that's in front of the community center. The lease currently expires on leap day of 2012. Uh, between now and then, we're due to receive revenue of 20900 uh, Edward Jones, which is a, which is a national firm that uh, does investment financial planning for its clients, uh, is looking at all of its offices in the greater Portland area uh, and is, is telling us that they're evaluating their, their lease holdings in this region with a possibility to put toward consolidation. And, but they have looked at our particular site and they'd like to keep it. Whether or not that's a negotiating position or, or true, we, we take it for uh, what it is. But regardless, what they're offering us is, is uh, to take the current lease and instead of waiting until 2012 to renew it, that we immediately renew it now. However, recognizing the market and recognizing the fact they're willing to sign a longer term contract, uh, they'd like to lease them out to actually go down, including for the unexpired term of the portion. The, 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 the bottom line is that under the current lease, uh, they haven't until 2012, and they'll, February 20, leap day, 2012, they'll give us a total of 20,900. If we sign the lease, you authorize me to sign it, we go to February 28, 2017, and we're guaranteed 99,524. And to, to me, the real issue is, do you take the, the, the guarantee of the 99,524, or do you take the 20,900, with the hope that we might be able to get them at a later date to sign for a higher amount or to get someone else to lease it at a higher amount. My, my recommendation is, is it's great to have a national uh, lease holder because you know in the end they're going to pay the money as opposed to you know, some small one that just disappears and there's a real tough cost of collection. Edward Jones, I looked them up, their stock price is way high. And, you know, absent you know, some big scandal, I think they're going to be doing just fine. Uh, their model of business seems to be that they're doing just fine. Uh, so anyway, I'd recommend that uh, I think it's overall it's a good deal for town. Obviously, I'd like to see more money. And you know, we, as I was talking to Councilor Walsh before the meeting, you know, we plow, we, we give them a lot of good services. It's not a bad deal for them either. Uh, but uh, it, you know, overall, I think when we look at rental properties in Cape Elizabeth, when we look at, you know, this is certainly not Class A office space, that we're better off having the, the 99000 guaranteed than just the 20900 guaranteed. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion? So the motion was, I think, to accept the lease. Do we need to indicate that we're authorizing you to sign it, or is that motion adequate? I think it's adequate. Okay. All those in favor of the motion? Thank you. It carries unanimously. Uh, item 41, 2011, uh, this is the agreement with Efficiency Main Trust. Uh, again, we have a uh, copy of the draft agreement which sets forth trust responsibilities and the municipality's responsibilities relating to the uh, Property Assessed Clean Ener Energy Program, or PACE. Uh, do I have a motion? Move to authorize the manager to sign the contract. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Motion carries. Item 42-2011.
uh, relating to the Registrar of Voters and uh, to the reappointment of Deborah Lane to serve as Registrar. Uh, Sarah. You want a motion? Sure. I move we reappoint Deborah M. Lane to serve as Registrar of Voters for a term to expire January 1st, 2013. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? Boy, I thought this was going to be a really controversial <laughs> motion. <laughs> Yeah, she want to make a statement. Yeah. Well, we really appreciate the uh, fine service you provide to the town in that role. Uh, so I will vote very enthusiastically in favor of this motion. All those in favor? The motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, before we go into the executive session, I believe it would be customary at this time for anybody, if they would like to comment on an item that's not on the agenda, to come forward to the lectern and uh, just identify yourself. And uh, my name is Tucker Jordan of uh, 83 Old Ocean House Road. I would just like to say, although uh, Mr. Harriman was very modest in saying he is not sure if he's the man for the job, um, as a third-generation farmer on the property that I'm on, and as many of you know, the Jordans settled this town and got the ball rolling for all of us. Uh, lobstering and the actual fishing that he does off of Cape Elizabeth is very important to the industry and not only the greater Portland area but Cape Elizabeth because it, there's, a, uh, there's an avenue of tourism that is going to hopefully for myself come into um, this area of Cape Elizabeth this summer as in doing lobster tours out of Kettle Cove. Um, having the harbor master in inside Cape Elizabeth gives him not only the insight but the ability to service both recreational and commercial fishermen and making sure that there's a fine line between where sailboats can put moorings and where they can't because you don't in an aspect of uh, the opportunity that it goes to Scarborough uh, you have a harbor master down there that's doing a fine job in the Scarborough area but might not quite understand how things have traditionally been in, uh, in this town and where you're a commercial fisherman and your day starts early in the morning and you're trying to get out um, to your boat, start it and get it ready, <clears throat> you, you don't want a sailboat, you know what I mean, 20 feet off your bow where you're trying to back up and line up your mooring. It's just not uh, logistically feasible to have that interaction. So with uh, both Mr. Harriman having not only the education, the expertise, the knowledge, um, and definitely all the insurance and uh, equipment for salvage overhaul and whatnot, uh, I'd just like to put my two cents in and say that um, if you do choose to you know, make a motion to select somebody rather than having an application process, he's definitely somebody for intern wise uh, for you know, the, short, the short term, be a good person to step in and, and do the role. Thank you. Can I ask Tucker a question? Sure. The risk of sounding like an idiot. What does a harbor master do? Uh, the so Full-time, part-time? In my, my understanding for the town of Cape Elizabeth, I would say it would be a extreme part-time position. Uh, Mr. Long, like, like uh, Mr. Harriman said, he did an awesome job uh, producing the nautical charts of, uh, of what the general layout of, of Cape Elizabeth's land bordering the sea was. But he didn't lack. He lacked the ability to get out and remove somebody's mooring if, say, they didn't pay their their mooring fee, or if somebody had an issue uh, getting getting their bottom chain up. He didn't have the equipment to do that. And well, like I said, Mr. You know, Daniel has done that since he was a kid. So he you know he certainly understands the. Uh, so he's just kind of there in the morning, <coughs> and all the fishermen are going out and. The harbor master? Yeah. No, he's never. Around. I mean, typically he's never been around. You just but mail would him. A, ideally, one would sort of be there in a the boat, kind of helping people go. Or in port in Portland, the harbor master has a, is a full time job. He has he has his own boat, his own truck. But whereas, you know, if you let's say you wanted to put a, a sailboat in and take and take your family out, but you didn't have the means to put your own mooring in. In my opinion, the harbor master should, if he wants the job, he should have either the contract or the means to get your to get your mooring out there, and certainly reprimand you if you don't pay your bill. Because the you know the, the believe the town's ordinance is if you don't pay your residential fifty dollars, um, 
your moron gets yanked, and right now the town doesn't have that equipment to do that. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, the town manager, you want to Just to add a little bit. The real importance of the harbor master is to make sure that the boats have a, a mooring <coughs> area in a length of a line to make sure the boats don't go crashing into each other. Right. Uh, we have a mooring plan that has a big circle that shows all the different locations potential for mooring. And it also, as Tucker alluded to, it involves making sure the equipment is in good stead because what you don't want, you know, people have, they invest, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in boats. Yes, yeah, some of us have. Yes, so it's really important that that asset is protected. And, and it's not only with Kettle Cove, but particularly uh, we've had major issues over the years at, uh, uh, at Maiden Cove. Uh, in fact, we had an appeal not too dissimilar to when the council heard uh, of a harbor master's decision to, to deny a permit that uh, the lawyers were hired and it got quite complicated. But anyway, uh, it pays $3,440. Uh, a year is in the budget, so it is, it's very part-time, and a lot of it's clerical, does the billing for the harbor master, uh, for the, the mooring permits, and we actually do, in fact, I, take in a little over uh, $4,000 a year for mooring permits, so the, the program supports itself with the limited amount we now spend. That's Frank? A, the question I really had, I mean, the question's coming up here, whether or not we can try to consolidate, but this is, this is after we make money on <laughs> on this part of our operations because the uh, fees exceed our cost of having our yeah, yeah, as I said earlier, I, Neil, and I, I, I just spoke to Mr. Harriman out in the hallway when the council was talking about another issue. Uh, you know, I, I think the, the chief of police is the supervisor of the harbor master. And I think he's right and it's appropriate that he look at other options. Uh, you know, but I, but I also very much appreciate it. I hadn't heard the, the, the input of the local fishing community. And one thing I suggest to Mr. Harriman is that we have a meeting some evening where we get the word out from the fishing community for them to come in and talk about whatever their issues are on so many different topics. So we'll look at settle, we'll look at possibly establishing that, working with the chief of police to, to gain input on whatever the issues are from the, the, uh, the community that, that does the work offshore but is so dependent on the shore for access. Uh, and for their life. Thank you very much for coming and staying to the bitter end. Oh, that's all right. To give your comments. We appreciate um, it. If I could just, I don't know quite uh, the way to go about this is, but I, from what I understand, the uh, fire department is now considered, any member is considered a town employee. Is that correct? They have been for a long time. For a long time. With, with, within <clears> certain <throat> provisions within the personnel code. For workers' comp, other things, they're town employees. Is there any interest in looking at the avenue of offering those firemen um, a chance to buy into the town's health insurance policy as a as a way to apply as a part-time um, employee we have not looked into that because <clears throat> I just from the understanding of how family groups work and um, corporation groups work the more employees you have the cheaper your premium becomes if I'm if I'm not wrong if you now add, say, 100 more employees to your town's medical policy, does that not only lower the premium, but allow people in the community to have more access to better health care, instead of being a self-employed farmer and lobsterman? If I might, on the first point, we're in what they call a self-rated plan, because we have more than 50, more than 50 <coughs> families covered, families and individuals covered on the plan. Uh, so self-rated, it depends on the experience health experience and utilization experience of all those individuals. Uh, so we already have essentially the rate that's dependent on, you know, if, if the firefighters and other folks were much younger, didn't have health care needs, they might be advantageous to add to a pool, but then you get the issue of, you know, how's it paid for, and, uh, how is it collected, and some of those issues. But it's something that could be looked at. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks again. Uh, before we go into executive session, I just wanted to point out our upcoming meetings in February. The Town Council has a workshop on February 7th. And our next Town Council meeting, public meeting, uh, is February 14th. Uh, Mike, did you want to, uh, we have financial reports listed on the agenda. Was there, did you intend to, there to be a discussion about that? No, that's just always there as an attachment so that if anyone wants to see them, it, it's how to get to them. Okay. 
At this, Sorry, go ahead. Quick question. Do, do, what's the agenda for the workshop on February 7th? Have we uh, I was going to discuss it with the okay. chair so as of now there is none. Okay. okay. So to be determined. So if uh, any members of the council think that there's an issue that it would be appropriate for the workshop, uh, please let me know. Just on that point, and I haven't mentioned this to, to David yet, we've had some discussions with South Portland and Scarborough. Uh, there's, there's interest in doing an, a, an electric co uh, cooperative whereby we would buy power uh, through a contract by, for, re for residents and small businesses in all three communities. And this discussion in February, I think the date's the 17th, it's now penciled as of an email I get today, of getting all three councils together to hear a presentation on this, how it would work, what the liabilities are, what the potential benefit is to the residents. But that, is a, that might be something that we might want to switch out the February workshop to do that on a date when the other two councils are available. We're talking about doing something at the South Pole Community Center. Any reactions to that suggestion? Great idea. Yeah, okay. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. maybe, we, maybe we can pursue that. Frank. But that respect, the, the uh, Portland Water District is essentially a cooperative, right? So we essentially have it is. ownership of a utility already. Yeah. Yeah. And so this would be expanding the one. It's, it's an interesting concept, and there's, there's pros and cons. And so the helpful and economic development director is the one primary one pushing it, but the finance director is very nervous about it. It's, it's, uh, it I think it's well worth listening to, and, and it, you know, it's not a slam dunk one way or another. Okay. Uh, and I think it, it's time for us to move on to item 43-2011 uh, relating to an executive session request. Do I have a motion? Uh, Jessica. I move that we move into executive session. Second. Okay. All those in favor of the motion? Motion carries. The motion will reflect the statutes. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. Okay, so uh, we can go off there. Thank you.